Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Rubin Museum of Art. I'm Tim McHenry. I'm the producer here. And uh, this is a museum of Himalayan art, yes, but it's uh, explored in ways that um, really expand our horizons in the most imaginative manner. Uh, last year, we uh, mounted an exhibition of Carl Gustav Jung's The Red Book, and we had a series of conversations called The Red Book Dialogues in which uh, psychoanalysts were invited on stage with people from other walks of life to interpret an image from the book of Carl Gustav Jung, The Red Book. So um, who knew that a year later we would be doing something quite similar with this extraordinary new um, repository of imagery called The Book of Symbols, published by Tashin and assembled by the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism. And uh, it's a real privilege and delight and appropriate for us, I think, to be launching um, the book here with a series of conversations, Red Book Dialogues, like um, that will explore uh, three basic um, images to be found in, in this book. Uh, I'm particularly proud to say many, many people have contributed to this book, and Ami Romberg, who will be on stage uh, very shortly, will, I'm sure, allude to them. But I just want to say as a, as a note of um, institutional pride that, in fact, one of our staff, um, a member of our education department, Laura Lombard, uh, contributed um, the uh, image of the tortoise to this book. So I hope you'll all leave through it when you get upstairs, um, and don't take too long about it either. Um, of course, as you members of the Rubin Museum of Art will know, um, while this uh, book is, is uh, being sold and retailed at a very, very reasonable price of $39.99, Rubin Museum of Art members receive all of $4 off that price. Isn't that worth it alone? But the book, of course, will be available upstairs after this session. Um, when uh, you're all invited to join us for a reception to celebrate the book. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite the first group, or pair, I should say, of conversationalists who are going to explore um, a number of um, images, um, in particular the loom and the weaver. And uh, the first of those, of course, is Ami Romberg, who is the national curator for Aras and is an expert on the psychological and artistic significance of mythology and symbols. And uh, this is her second appearance on stage. She was last here for the Red Book Dialogues in conversation with a tarot card reader, Patty Canova. She's joined by a New York-based artist, Leslie Dill, who uses a variety of media and techniques to explore themes of language, the body, and transformational experience. And this is also her second appearance on stage. Uh, she was one of the first contemporary artists to take the stage here at the Rubin Museum of Art when we first opened our doors in 2004. celebrate this book with you all tonight. Yeah. It's been many years to the making, and we're so pleased to have you here. And uh, I, I want to thank the staff who has been um, through this book in Ryan Wet, as we say in Swedish. And we, we have worked together as a team, a fantastic de team, um, uh, in, um, in, to do this book together with all the writers. First, I want to thank uh, Kathleen Martin, who is the editor and the Jungian analyst. So she was able to um, add the deep psychological meaning to many of the symbols. Um, so that's something very special, to, unique to this book of symbols. During the years, many people asked us, why we do another book of symbols? There are so many. And we always had the same answer, because nobody has done it with images. I think images is the language of symbols. So, so um, we had three artists uh, in the team, and they added their special uh, sensibility to the book, and I think you can see that in the images and choices of images. They are Karen Arm, sitting here in front. <laughs> Antti 
Leonie. Capoeira. And we also have a singer, songwriter, and, and a musician, uh, Alison Langrack, who is the online editor. So you can see we had a lot of fun during this time. I also want to t thank the ARAS board who helped and support and worked on this book. Melinda Haas, the president. And, um, Sarah Banker. And, um, I see Diane Fremont. <laughs> and, um, I don't know if Bruce's parent is here. No, not yet. And Dan Lindley, we may see them soon. So, and I don't know, maybe our, our um, German editor, Florian Kobler, may have arrived. No. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he's in New York for just a couple of days, so maybe he will join us later. So. So. I wanted to ask you, Ami, after all these years of preparing this book, what is there that's personally important to you that is the reason at this time and in this place that you have done this book? I think I want to answer with a dream. Mm -hmm. This is a dream that someone, uh, one of the writers, told me at the very beginning uh, of this project many years ago now. She had this dream that she, she had a book, a reference book or a dictionary of some kind. And when she opened it and looked at the <coughs> images, they fell off the page and turned into fruit that you could eat. <laughs> and I think it sort of shows how delicious it is to work with images. <laughs> and I think that's why people really flock at, at museums and uh, galleries because there's such a hunger for images but there's, uh, we are sort of surrounded by images in, in a way that we haven't been for ever. <laughs> but it is as if there's something missing in the images, um, the deeper meaning of the images, and that's what's been the great satisfaction to work with this book. So, um, what, what was your uh, response to this book when you saw it? Well, I got this book on a Saturday afternoon, and I sat down on the couch, and I felt uh, the heft <laughs> of it. But yet it fits really nicely in, in the lap, sitting on the couch. So I started to just flip through the pages. And what I think happened was, I think that the impact of the images rose up and hit me before the, I could acknowledge with my mental mind the details of the visual image. So it felt like, after a few minutes, it felt as if I was opening and reading a book of flames because I could feel the heat of the impact before I could calm it down with the registering of the details. So I thought, well, I'll to calm myself down a little. I'll, um, I'll just read, you know, I'll read the, what is usually thought of as the explanation, but actually the explanation was as fiery as the um, imagery, so I felt as if the flames were starting to drink downwards, and I thought this is wonderfully enlivening, but not very good for my Saturday night sleep life. So, so I shut the book, and the next day I just went through, actually, it's true, I went through all 807 pages. Oh, I did. And it made me think about what we were talking about, about impact and threshold. Kafka wrote, I am a hesitation before birth. My life is a hesitation before birth. Sometimes before threshold, before impact, before realization, we hold, it's as if we hold our breath. We don't, we're not ready to breathe it in yet. You know, we're looking at it. And we're not ready to absorb it and to exhale it yet. So we hold our breath. And this symbol is a kind of gateway to recognition and to pass through to an understanding of recognition 
we actually have to eat the seed symbol, I think. You know, not just read it. It has its own uh, nourishment, and we eat it, and the seed symbol goes into us. And Kafka also said he felt as if the way were opening before him to the unknown nourishment he craved. As artists and writers and poets, it's our job to make images of impact, if we can. We have, as part of this process, almost a reverse symbol atmospheric process first. There's a blind electrical nudging inside, a blind electrical nudging inside that rises up, and then it comes to this idea realization place. And then your mental mind becomes alert, and it comes down and reaches down to pull this up. And at this precise moment of recognition, this is when we are the most present and the most alert. This is the space of engaged reverie. Um, yes, symbols and uh, images are belong to the threshold. Hmm. Um, it is as if you can see through. The image helps you to see through to, to another reality. There is a, a, a ritual in India called darshan, which is about seeing through to another reality. And it's also to be seen by the divine. So the image is that kind of in-between place. And I just want to read a poem that's in the uh, entry on crack, which is an in-between place as well, an opening, by Octavio Paz. I just want to say we have included a lot of poetry because that is also an image in words. So this is what he says. Between what I see and what I say, between what I say and what I keep silent, between what I keep silent and what I dream, between what I dream and what I forget, poetry. So, so here's our image for tonight of weaving. Um, so, well then why did you, why, we spoke, but why did you ultimately choose this image? I mean, at the core, why did you choose this image? I think because it, um, is so close to nature and to spirit. You see the little bird, the weaver of nests, in sort of a tree-like structure, and there's the woman really present. And, the, and his, the little bird is sitting like on a tree, and they are connected, the tree and woman, through um, the loom. They are, uh, in many cultures, the upper beam of the loom is called the beam of heaven and the lower beam connected to her, she's actually tied it to her body around her back, uh, is it represents the earth, and in between the world of creation is taking place. Uh, and all, and it's sort of all these opposites, uh, you know, weaving is the most simple of structures. It's just crossing of sets of threads, interlacing, and so this becomes an image of all crossings, of all meetings, like time and space, when things take form, the sexual union, where the child is being born, and um, uh, as if they're being born, uh, sort of woven in the woman's body. Um, so Leslie, what do you see in this image? Oh. I love this image, and we had spoken earlier, and I was a young weaver, as was Ami, and um, my great aunt Peggy taught me how to weave when I was 10 years old. So very early on, I learned the touch of the thread, the touch of the string, the touch of the yarn, and this has become a fingertip touchstone for me in my life and in my work. And if I think of a or if I try to think of a metaphor for the world loom, actually, you know, it sort of feels as if we're swimming through this amazingly dense ocean of symbols. It's so buoyant. I feel like I keep trying to go down, and it just pops you right back up. Like, <laughs> so, okay, down to speak. So it reminds me, this world loom, of when I was in Nepal, and I climbed this hill to this temple, and um, 
Over the gateway of this temple, there was a plated metal ribbon-like thing. And I had never seen this before over the gateway of, or over the doorway of a temple. So I asked the man, you know, what, what is this for? And he said, oh, madam, this is the tongue of God. And you stand right here, and your words will go right up this to the heaven of the ear of God, to the sky point, the tip point of the temple. And I thought this was amazing that you stand on the earth, you, you can almost touch this metal, tangible rhythm, ri rhythm, ribbon, and it leads right up into transcendent thought. And for me, this thread, this is why in my work I use a lot of threads. There are, the threads move us from outside the world to the inside world. And it is also the use of threads in the work it's a quiet reminder to me that making art and looking at art is a kind of prayer. Yeah, it's a prayer to looking yeah. at art too, really. Yeah. Um, there is um, a, tra a tradition in African art, in Dogon myth, that weaving, um, the, the, about weaving, the first ancestors, their mouths was a loom, so they were weaving both the fabric and words, and, it, and this is interesting, it comes up also in our um, words of text and textile, it comes from the same origin, to weave. Mm. <coughs> yeah. um. So, um, I know you look, use text and, uh, yeah. and words in your art, can you say something about that? I can, and I think if I may, before that, I was reading and researching for this, and I was reading about the Gnostic, Kabbalistic um, myth of before the fall of Adam and Lucifer, there was the belief that the whole of heaven was a single human being woven of fine, luminous fabric. And this giant, androgynous, primordial Adam, who is now in every human being and is shrunken inside us like a little cloth, waiting to go back up to heaven. So yesterday I really liked this, and today I don't like this at all, because I think, <laughs> I, I don't really think that I want this iridescent homunculus of fibrous, like, cloth, you know, like a little hairball inside my body. So I'm going to recant my research and like, um, go back to the Buddhist Hindu world where the, everything is a luminous cloth. And, and speaking of texts, of course, for me as a person and an artist, or for any of us here really, the mere presence of, oh, we have to stay back, the mere presence of language in a room is in itself a symbol, inside a symbol, inside a symbol. I'm sure most of us here, like when you walk into someone's living room, you can smell where the books are. I can, I can sort of smell where the books are. Whereas when I walk into somebody's place, I don't really smell the TV. And, <laughs> and I can never find my cell phone, so it doesn't seem to have any comparative magnetism for me. But for all, and with that, for all that language is supposed to represent the intellectual, rational mind. From my experience of reading this on my lap and getting lit on fire, I feel that words actually represent irrational doors of understanding, not rational ones. I think there's a sense of potential catastrophe in even the softest word, like faith or gentle. Kafka said, faith, like a guillotine, is heavy as light. And Emily Dickinson said, how ruthless are the gentle. The crisis that's potential is the intrusion of the irrational mixed up forces, the uncontrollable context the uncontrollable response. I mean, language really opens up like a mess. So 
And there is vertigo that we have as readers in response to certain kinds of reading. But doesn't it sometimes you feel like you're all lined up and you'll read another word and you're like not all lined up at all? It's as if we're almost always on the verge of a visionary trance just to read. And like this book tonight, it was also a book that startled me away. 20 years ago, it was the language of the poet Emily Dickinson that woke up some deep imagistic place and began producing streams of images from my blind, deaf, and blind, dumb intestinal body, like just coming out. The words would come in, and out would come these images like little horsemen with little swords on horses saying, make me, make me now. <laughs> so in my work, like a weaving, I must have both image and text. And I hope you don't think I'm too self-referential, but I was asked to talk about my work. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. I apologize. If it's uh, yeah. Okay, I'll go back to swooning into listening. To <laughs> maybe, um, uh, maybe I'd I'd be personal too. I'll tell a dream uh, that I had um, when I first came in. My, I, I'm a weaver too. My mother taught me to weave and. I saw an ad when I moved to New York about a loom, a Canadian old wooden loom, and I bought it and I was in heaven. And I had a dream uh, shortly afterwards that uh, my whole body was a loom. Mm -hmm. And my breathing was uh, the rhythm of the breathing and the heartbeat was the breathing and the rhythm of the loom. Um, and I think that became sort of the impetus for me to decide to write weaving in, in, for this book. And, the reason why we talk about it tonight. Um, is there any symbol or object that's important to you? Well, that idea of you being a loom is oh, so big. The symbol I was thinking of is very small. <laughs> the symbol that I was thinking of for myself is the oak leaf. and. For me, when I was 14 years old, a little girl growing up in Maine, I was given to have um, a vision. It was early winter, much like this time of year, and I was looking out the window at the oak leaves against the sky, and my bedroom was obliterated with a huge, shimmering world of darkness and lightness, completely took, there's no sense of I. And in this shimmering world of threads of light, um, the words uh, beyond my 14-year-old experience of pestilence and ravaging and sorrow were present and active in this vision. And they were actually patterned into, I guess, okayness by the whole experience being suffused with um, kind of bliss and rapture. And on that day, I lost my innocence of the separation of good and evil. But I actually gained an innocence of faith. So in my work, I use the oak leaf and leaves a lot. And it has also created a challenge and a yearning for me to try to recreate this understanding of the tremendous world. I think that it's a wonderful vision to end with this part with. Thank you, Leslie. I think what's so useful about these uh, conversations is that um, they draw you in through the very particular in order to illustrate the general. And uh, that, of course, is what symbols should do. Um, you know, I think if you come here to this museum often enough, you get a sense that everything is integrated and interwoven in some form or other. And I'm just reminded that, you know, Ami started this whole um, program with uh, the illustration of a dream. And lo and behold, in the spring, um, we're um, bringing back the um, science um, series Brainwave, we will have neuroscientists and cognitive scientists on stage with other people and analyzing and talking about the nature of dreaming and what its significance is in our lives. Um, 
in, and in our work. So um, thank you for that allusion. That always gives me a chance to um, promote something else. Um, <laughs> I'd like uh, to uh, promote the next two conversationalists. Uh, Priscilla Rogers contributed uh, the passages of um, the goat, dog, and river to this book. She's a Jungian analyst in private practice in the city and is a founding member of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association. And she's joined by uh, the renowned puppeteer Dan Herlin, um, who uh, has received many prizes for his work, including the Albert Award um, in the Arts uh, for Theater, and just last year was named a USA Artist Prudential Fellow in Theater. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Tim. Um, of course, we're going to talk about the eye. It's a wonderful image of the eye. Um, and I think um, I, I loved what I loved in Ami's was the idea of uh, images being food that you could eat. But of course, images we think of often as visual. So we're going to be concentrating on the visual and um, doing that. And I guess we're going to weave in and out of a lot of the many, many complex ideas of um, the image of the eye. Um, so um, where I'd like to start, I'm just going to uh, show you the images that are in the book first here, and then we're going to land on the last one. We're going to leave it there. So um, these are the little eye idols that are in the book when you get the book. Look at these. Um, and uh, here's a beautiful uh, mosaic of that. World Eye. Here's the, to many, very familiar Eye of Horus, right? The uh, eye that was um, dismembered and remembered um, and then became a uh, powerful symbol of healing and regeneration. And this image is known as the unsighted twin. Okay, obviously the twin was sighted. This one is unsighted. So that's just an introduction. So um, Dan, it's wonderful to meet you. And you we too. did just met and did just see each other <laughs> for the first time. Um, and uh, you actually chose to work on the image of the eye. You wanted to talk about the image of the eye. So what is it about the eye that moved you so that you wanted to do this? Uh, I. I personally, I have a voracious visual appetite. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, if, if it could be said, if this makes any sense, I love to look at things. And um, a while ago, I made a, uh, I made a puppet piece um, called Everyday Uses for Sight, because I realized that my, um, my wanting to look at things actually kind of scratched a number of itch, itches. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and that it, it provided um, all kinds of different um, functions. Um, the one example that I can think of is in the piece, uh, in, in the, it's, a, it's a series of pieces, and in the first piece, I pair an, an autobiographical story with a historical story. The historical story is um, the unveiling of um, Frederick Church's uh, masterpiece, The Heart of the Andes, which he unveiled in, I think, 1825. And when he unveiled it, um, he asked people to come to look at the painting through opera glasses. And um, uh, what you, what, you can still do this when you go to the painting, if you take like, a piece of paper and roll it up and look at it this way, you can still get the, the, the experience that they had at the time, which is that the, the painting is incredibly detailed. You can see villages and insects even, and a huge mountain in the background. But when you block out all of the surrounding context, if you block out the museum, you block out the frame, and you even block out parts of the painting, it enables you to actually enter the painting more vividly and to kind of feel like you're living in it. And there are reports of women fainting from the extreme experience of the time. <laughs> and I just, I loved that story, you know, fainting from looking. Oh, visionary fainting. <laughs> And I paired it with a, an autobiographical story about me growing up in a very small town in rural New Hampshire, um, and being, you know, knowing that I was very different, um, knowing that I wanted to be an artist already, and you know, being, you know, being gay and being, you know, in a town that really didn't know what that was, and I was terrified of being beaten up by bullies, 
And so what I would do is I would run home from school and I would grab this big coffee table book of impressionist paintings and I just lived in them. I mean, I, I just poured over them and I lived in them and I looked at them and I fell in love with them to the point where at 10 years old, if you pointed to any impressionist painting, even if I didn't know, if, even if I'd never seen the painting before, I knew the painter's hallmark so well I could identify who did it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that in, that in some ways I was using sight to kind of block out my context. I was mm -hmm. living in this, looking in this book as a way of not seeing the rest of the world because it was too mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, it really, it, it so brings up um, some of what uh, comes up around the symbol of the eye about the duality between, you know, what you see outwardly with your eyes, where the eyes see out, mm -hmm. and then also when you're seeing with the mind's eye and the eye sees in. And that whole blocking out of the context is also like such a metaphor for how we see out because we're always picking, mm -hmm. you know, we're always blocking something out of the great detail of everything that's in the world. So this tremendous duality of, of seeing, which is a lot of, a lot of what, um, a lot of it, what I also saw in some of your other pieces that I've actually seen a couple of the pieces and we'll talk about them, them in a minute that you've done. But the other thing um, that we were talking about a little bit in the like two seconds that we got to meet before, <laughs> before we came up here is um, kind of talking about, because you're a um, theater artist working in puppetry, um, what exactly, as a visual artist, what's, what's a puppet? And, <laughs> and that might have something to do with the eye and, how we see. Oh, I think it does. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot, a no, in a number of different ways. Um, I, first of all, I think puppetry is primarily a visual art form. Um, I think it's more closely aligned to film and dance than it is to theater, because theater is kind of, in the way that it's practiced here, is primarily a literary art form. And puppets, I, I hate to break it to you, don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> They, what they do is they move. They move as if they talk, but they don't actually talk. And they're made to move. So the communication happens through movement. And they're designed, so they're, they're visual. And they function like ciphers. They're blank slates onto which an audience can project anything. Um, I, I, was, I was telling Priscilla before there's a in a piece I did called Hiroshima Maiden, there was a main character who cried in one of the scenes. And a woman at the end of the show came up to me and said, oh, I love that scene where she cried. And I looked at her and I said, just because I'm snarky, I said, she's paper mache. <laughs> but what I loved about it was that the woman in the audience had supplied that, had seen that in the puppet. Um, and had lived it in her own experience, in her own head. And I, you know, I, I find that much more engaging for an audience member than to be kind of shown everything and told everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think about, uh, I think about that. I also was telling you that the, one of the puppeteers that I work with, when he's puppeteering, he, he describes the process of puppeteering not as manipulating the puppet or manipulating the object, but he feels that he's in the role of an observer and that he, in the same way that you're an observer watching someone who's walking ahead of you on the street, he has to interpret, interpret um, what the puppet is doing by watching it from behind. And he feels very much like he's invested in observing. So that in that way, our eye really does make our world in that way. At oh, least, yeah. you know, what he's making, he's seeing and and that projection's another way. Yeah, and you said that about the projection, yeah. seeing projections, that's projection, really Projection, because you're seeing with your, you're projecting your light outward. Yes. Through yeah. your eye and seeing what you, I guess, sometimes want to see. Yeah, well, you know, But also sometimes what is the, un, the unseen presence that's in the work there. Yeah. That, that maybe you've seen. Well, and I was going to say that a, another thing that you're seeing is, you know, being the director, you're seeing what I want you to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, you know, being a director is a very kind of manipulative thing. Mm -hmm. You're manipulating our vision. <laughs> 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 
um, uh, which is interesting, because Hiroshima Maidens, one of the ones that I had seen, and you may want to tell everybody a little bit about what it's well, about. It, it's, it? it's based on a true story about uh, 25 women who were brought to the United States in 1955 for reconstructive surgery after surviving the Hiroshima um, atomic bomb. And um, the State Department didn't want them here because, um, this is interesting and apropos, mm -hmm. didn't want them here because they were trying to find peaceful applications for nuclear power. And it was kind of their worst nightmare to have these disfigured women here. So they made a deal with the State Department that they could be here and they could make public appearances, which they had to do to continue to raise money for their surgeries, um, with the proviso that they only be seen in silhouette. Uh, so they went on these tours and they spoke and uh, they did uh, appearances where they r raised money for their surgeries. And one of, the, um, one of the things that they did to raise money for their surgeries was they appeared on the television program This Is Your Life, which I think some of you I probably remember, I remember. Um, the, you know, the idea was that there would be a guest of honor and you'd hear the voice of somebody and you'd guess who it was and then they'd trot out your second grade school teacher and you'd have a little reunion on stage. And one of the people that the producers decided to uh, reunite them with was the pilot of the Enola Gay. <laughs> <I'm> getting that <laughs> response. I, my first thought was, puppet show. <laughs> So, but it, it, it was, it was because it was, you know, um, it was a Japanese-American story, it was a Japanese story, and so I went to Japan and studied the bunlaku, which is one of the traditional mm -hmm. forms in Japan, and told that story in bunlaku style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the eye, the eye and seeing seems to be really prevalent, obviously, in that piece, and also the idea of the eye where you're being looked at, right. when you're talking about right. the, the, um, that of course in a lot of the imagery um, is the more scorching kind of looking at eye, the solar eye of the hot sun. And I think Hiroshima Maiden is also about the experience of being looked at. At, yeah, yeah. being, yeah, and then and hidden. Mm -hmm. and like you're saying, it includes some more of that sort of manipulation, uh, a different kind of manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but the propagandic yeah. manipulation of what you see you know, that always puts the eye in question. Yeah, you know? there was a news blackout on images of survivors that wasn't lifted until 1964. So Americans weren't, wouldn't, had, didn't have the opportunity to see survivors, only the rubble. Right, right. So we're, you know, we're going down the road here of, um, of kind of the many valences of what you actually see outwardly and can't see and this kind of thing. and. Um, you know, the unsighted twin that you liked is also, of course, about the insight of the eye and the way the eye sees in rather than out. And um, the other piece of yours that I had seen was Disfarmer, which is a, a puppetry piece about the, I think he's Arcan Arkansas? Yeah. Arkansas photographer, um, Mike Disfarmer, and that's his name that he gave himself, right? He was Mike Meyer. So his his real name was Mike Meyer, but he hated his, he thought Meyer meant farmer in German, and he hated his agricultural community and his family so much that after his mother died, he legally changed his name to Dis Farmer, <laughs> distance himself from him. <laughs> But he was a wonderful uh, portrait photographer. He ran a, uh, a portrait studio in this very tiny little town, and he was, by all accounts, he was kind of the Boo Radley of Heber Springs. He was very, very curmudgeonly and not very nice. He was very misanthropic, and people would come to have their picture made and pay 25 cents, and then he would just sort of bark at them to stand there. And he was, uh, I, I was talking to Priscilla earlier and said he was sort of like an entomologist in a way, kind of like pinning these specimens against his back wall because there was no props, there was no fancy poses, mm -hmm. there was no backdrop, they were just standing there. Mm -hmm. So there's more looking at. Yeah, they, and they, he, they were just yeah, open like up. Pinning him up. Yeah, they were yeah. just completely open to being looked at. Mm -hmm. And the other thing um, about that piece that I remember so well is that the puppet handlers are actually seen on the stage. So that a lot of what would normally be invisible about what's moving this character, the sort of invisible, visible polarity was there 
in that, which is, is an audience member, was very uncanny and it, it's interesting. Know, it, it's actually kind of a Brechtian trip, you know, mm-hmm. a trick, you know, to sort of have a, a have magic on the stage, but at the same time reveal how it's mm-hmm. done. And those two things can live in your brain simultaneously, mm-hmm. and the, the tension between them is kind of thrilling. Mm-hmm. It's, that's the two eyes. Oh, yeah. The inner eye and the, the, the both of those can live in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right? nice. <laughs> She's smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. <well. laughs> oh, you, you see it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I do now. <laughs> Um, the, yeah, this, the other thing, because um, we're almost out of our allotted time, and we're going to have to sh- uh, shift our shape soon. Um, and, uh, but you had said one really beautiful um, thing from one of the scripts. Oh. That, yeah. About one of the characters in your script. Yeah, in the, in the Everyday Uses for Sight piece, it's narrated by a blind accordion player. And he t- he's the one who actually tells the story of the, um, the paint of the, uh, the unveiling of the Heart of the Andes. And he talks about how when you block out the context, you can live more fully in the thing. And then he says, imagine how fully I'm living. I managed to block out everything. <laughs> so with that, I think that's a beautiful place for us to end. Thanks. And, um, Thank Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, Dan. Um, our final pair of conversationalists are um, Sherry Salmon and Pat Steer. Uh, Sherry um, was seen last um, here at the Rubin Museum of Art in the company of um, David Byrne at the Red Book Dialogues. And she's an analyst, writer, and founding member and first president of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association. And she's joined by the painter Pat Steer, uh, who will now go on stage. Um, Pat, of course, um, has actually exhibited here at the Rubin Museum of Art in the exhibition The Missing Piece um, four years ago. And um, uh, her painterly approach and draftsman-like approach of words and symbolic marks, um, she approaches art in a way like a gymnast to quote her, first the meditation and then the leap. So let's see where they leap uh, in the shape-shifting world of symbols. Hello, thank you, Terry. And we really are going to leap because we're we're not sure exactly what we're going to talk about. Um, I was under the impression we'd be shape-shifting, and Pat was under the impression we'd be transforming, which are both two (laughs) entries in in the book. So we're going to see where this goes. And I think let's just go through the the images that are in shape-shifting. And there's an eye in this third eye spot. And I think I'll start just to read a little poem that's also part of the entry that goes like this. In the very earliest time when both people and animals walked the earth, A person could become an animal if he wanted to, and an animal could become a human being. Sometimes they were people, and sometimes animals, and there was no difference. All spoke the same language. That was the time when words were like magic. The human mind had mysterious powers. Nobody could explain this. That's just the way it was. And that's an an old Inuit poem. Now, when Pat and I met uh, this evening and we realized we were having a shape shift <laughs> right off the bat, uh, we started talking about the difference, what might be the differences between shape shifting and transformation. And uh, as we talked a little bit, Pat, you had said to me that you didn't like shape shifting and that it was scary. So maybe that's a good place for us to begin. Well, I like reality. <laughs> I love, or I love what I see. I, I, my, my mentors were three realists: 
John Cage, Agnes Martin, and Stala Witt. And I'm, I'm a realist. Um, for me, transformation is the realist thing that happens because everything always changes. It, it's never the same. If I look in the mirror twice a minute apart, I see something different in the next minute. I, I take my photograph every night before I leave the studio. And so I have a, I have, <laughs> I have a diary of a physical transformation of myself. But um, the more things stay the same, the more they change. And so transformation is, is, is the reality and it's, it's, it's part of what's meant when you say there is no self because you, there is no self because it's always a different self. And I first realized this when I was in my first apartment as a young woman. Someone knocked on the door and I said, who is it? And I didn't know a soul in the city and he said, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was a plumber and he, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> and I realized we're all me to me. <laughs> and so shape-shifting uh, scares me because it's the trickster, the magician, the, the liar, the not real, the not true, the dishonest, and the stuck, because the shape-shifter shifts back. He's, he's one moment a bear, and the next moment he's, he's the shaman digging a hole for putting in the, the corn seed. And I've seen him as a bear, and I've seen him as a shaman, but I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he's not, he's not honest. He's, he's the magician, he, and he's the trickster, you know. He, he's the man with the dice on the street who makes you bet, mm -hmm. and you lose your bet, because he knows what he's doing to you. And so it's impermanent change and not, not permanent change. Uh, transformation is just a fact of life. I, if I have some property that has a little waterfall on it and every day the waterfall uh, eats away at some of the rock. <laughs> and so from year to year and season to season and day to day and moment to moment, it's a different waterfall and it can never go back. It's always different and it doesn't fool me. It just is what it is becoming what it's becoming. And not is what it is, which is very, very stuck to me. Um, my, my own work is about transformation. I pour paint and the paint looks like water. Mm -hmm. So it transforms itself into an image. And of course, because it's on canvas, the, the image does change and decay. It changes color, it turns yellow, it turns blue. It, with time, changes in the way that we change in time. I don't, my pleasure in it is, is not controlling it too much. Of course, I know how to control it because I've been doing it for a long time. So I've, I've learned about control. But um, it's always a little, it's, it's also transforming, it's also making itself. It can never be, it can be tweaked, but it can't be completely controlled. And it's what I love about it, and it's what, what I love about um, <coughs> Zen meditation, really, is that it's, um, nothing magic happens. <laughs> and I enjoy that a lot. <laughs> that it's the, it's the, um, The, the space, the vast space of, of, let's say, the universe is the vast space inside. It's the sacred in, it's the sacred in the space inside. And so maybe I can see the color red and I make a bunch of red paintings, but it isn't shape-shifting. It's just um, a floating insight. When you, when you, um so you wouldn't experience it as uh, revealing itself, revealing something that was already there. Because sometimes shapeshifters do that too. There's sort of a, um, an understanding of the underlying unity 
in everything, and the shapeshifter will show you this piece of it one moment, and then another piece of it another moment, and, and there's a, a flux and a flow there. But it sounds like you don't experience, when you're working with red, you wouldn't necessarily experience it that way, that it shows a bit of what red is like here, and then a bit of what red is like from a different angle. Uh, I just wouldn't think of it as shape-shifting. Mm -hmm. I, I think of shape-shifting as really the, the shaman, the magician, mm -hmm. the trickster, mm -hmm. the card player, the guy who sells you a bad bottle of perfume. <laughs> just, I think of that as the shape-shifter, the liar. Mm -hmm. I, think of, I think of the liar as the shape-shifter and a, a transformation as a, a, what naturally happens. So that, I don't, let's say, I, I do love it when the coat hanging in the corner, you know, looks like a tree out the window. And I love it when the red bird high on a tree branch, uh, as you get closer, reveals itself to be a child's glove to, tied to a lower branch. Mm -hmm. I love that. So that's a good shape shift. <laughs> well, I don't even think of it as a shape shift. I think of it as um, something that happens in the eye, really. Mm -hmm. and the glove didn't do a thing. Right. right. The coat in the corner didn't do any. It didn't do anything. It's my misunderstanding, and I enjoy that misunderstanding. But. This guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> what he's up to? Well, that's a, <laughs> he's instead of a werewolf, he's a were jaguar. Yeah, right. And it's I a don't know. It's a shamanic, yeah. you know, trance state, and that, that the shape shifting has a lot to do with altered states, whether that's drug induced or mental mm -hmm. illness induced, or we were talking a little bit about whether meditation qualifies as an altered state or not. Yeah, and sort of we were coming out to maybe a feeling it was somewhere in, in the middle. See, I just don't think it's an altered state. I, I think it's um, approaching a natural state. Mm -hmm. So it's not altered because even though there's no self, you do know who's meditating. <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's not an altered state, it's a, it's a natural state. And um, you, you don't, meditate yourself into being a dra jaguar. I spent, in my youth, a lot of time on the Navajo reservation mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Arizona. And, but the Navajos, I never saw them shape shift. Were there any trickster ceremonies or? I didn't see thing? any, no. Yeah. I saw yeah. it, it, psychoanalytic ceremonies, in fact, you know. Um, really? The sand painting where um, they identify uh, you, like Freudian in a way, I don't know much about Jungian psychology, but um, like Freudian psychology, you know, you, you, you drove the car into the wall because you ate a cactus before it bloomed mm -hmm. when you were two. Mm -hmm. And so they, they identify things in that way. So it's like Freudian psychology. Um, very much. And they, no, no, they have cures. It's really not funny. What? That's good. They, they have true cures. That's what the sand painting, that's part of the sand painting uh, ceremony and the winter ceremonies, the snake dance ceremonies yeah. are about that. Um, identifying what happened that made you be in an unhappy state. Now, what happened then? So it's not really shape shifting, and well, part of what the shape shifters do is turn things upside down. Yeah. Or what you see, what you you're able to see, what you couldn't see, and you see things that aren't there. That I mean, it's a mm -hmm. switching of levels of reality to reveal the fact that, I mean, speaking of the eye, that there's more to it, or more to things than what they appear to be. So often, you know, shape shifters will change sex or they'll change form, and that's. The symbolism has to do with a kind of a revelation and a hiding of mm -hmm. one aspect of reality as another emerges. I know many people who love that, but I don't trust it. Mm -hmm. I just yeah, don't say, trust say it. Say more about that. <laughs> <laughs> you have a strong feeling about that. Well, I've known a lot of shapeshifters. <laughs> <laughs> the nasty ones. <laughs>
<laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so I find it, you know, ah, poo. <laughs> take, take it someplace else. Don't trouble me with it. Um, <laughs> so when you approach your work, you're, you're, not at, you're not looking at it, speaking of I again. You're not looking at it or approaching it to reveal to you an aspect of what's, what was already there that you might not have seen before. That's not the... It sounds like that's not the way you might describe the meditation that begins before you take no, I the can't, that I don't think of that as shape-shifting. Yes, everything I know about everything, I know through making art, which does not mean anything about the quality of the art or the way the art looks. It's the process of making art has taught me many things. And, um, but... And so, yes, the art has revealed many things to me, but not the way it looks. So, I, I, uh, it's hard to, hard to uh, picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you, 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 the subject matter, wind and water, is It's so not my only subject matter. Oh, yeah. that is, it, the subject matter is pouring the pain. Oh, say more about that. Is it well, only because the paint takes its own shape. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in what shape it'll take. But that's not shape-shifting because it, it changes. And so I think of it more as transformation. But I don't think of it as the art transforming. I think of myself as transforming through making it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's different. Of, of course, um, I make choices. I, I choose the scale. The sc I, was ha I have a friend who is a great poet, and her name is Mei Mei Bersenbrugge. I have several poet, great poet friends, Ann Waldman and Mei Mei are two of them. And Mei Mei and I were having lunch, and Mei Mei said, I'm trying to think about the difference between the sacred and the spiritual, if there is a difference. And I just jumped right into that. And, um, So I thought if pouring the paint could make a sacred space, and I was thinking of the Tuscan caves mm -hmm. and tunnels in, in the Etruscan caves in Tuscany, and that they dug probably with a very small tool, mm -hmm. this uh, cave tunnel that was wide at the bottom and narrow at the top. When you went through it, you could see the sky through the top. At the same time, walking through the tunnel, uh, I had the feeling, am I going to ever get out of here? Am I going it, to... It, it was a tourist site, but there was no ticket taker, <laughs> no, no touring. He disappeared. Just, yeah, just my husband and me. And we went through, and um, at the end of the tunnel, there was a meadow. Now, I don't know if I dreamed that meadow or if it was really there. If we, ever, if we just turned around and ran, or, we, or, or if I saw the meadow in a dream, but it, <coughs> for me, that was about transformation mm -hmm. and also the sacred, the idea of the sacred. The same with, I'm a big fan of Richard Serra's um, mm -hmm. last sculptures, mm -hmm. which, which I think are also dealing with a, well, it was a sacred space in the same way. And uh, all of this I find as re realism. And transformation, I think of transformation as an ultimate realism. Like you, you're a baby, then you're a child, then you're a girl, then you're a woman, then you an old lady, and then you die. And that seems to me transformation. Whereas shape-shifting, to me, means endless life. I just go back and forth mm -hmm. <laughs> in this life endlessly. <laughs> Not, not reincarnation, which seems to um, not usually involve memory or going back to the same shape, which I find comforting. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, shape-shifting, I don't know, I find these guys scary. 
I never saw a, a shaman who shape shifted only loves in trees and coats on rags. Yeah, that can be scary enough sometimes in itself. Right? <laughs> well, I think that might be a good moment to end. And thank you, Pat. And thank everybody. Tim's going to start with us in a few minutes. Fortunately, it's not quite the end because um, we'd, we'd sort of like to hear what sort of symbols you enjoy or are inspired by. And so we thought we'd um, open it up for questions for a bit. And we've got microphones on either side of the house. Do, Let me just switch out that. that. Okay. And um, if our uh, panelists would like to come to the front of the stage and, and Sherry and Pat will stay on stage. And uh, if you want to raise a hand and ask a question, we've got about um, 12 minutes to do so. And uh, before we go upstairs, um, please go for it. Yes, sir, you had your hand up. The microphone's ready for you. Hi, good evening. Um, Roger Penrose uh, discovered, uh, he's a physicist, he discovered uh, concentric circles in the uh, cosmic background, microwave background radiation. It's like the, the whole universe. Uh, he found concentric circles in there, and they're, they're still debating uh, as to the interpretation of it. Uh, Roger Penrose says that uh, it proves that the universe is cyclical. So, um, but they're, of course, they're debating it. But um, my question is, um, the, the fact of the matter is they found the circles in there, in the data, which mean, probably means something. What does a circle mean to you? If you could share a simple circle, what does it mean? Thank you. means can mean uh, the beginning can mean um, the, the the emptiness the circle where the emptiness that's not full that's not um, the, the void that's not empty it's sort of a circle of the beginning that's what I think of and then also the cyclical movement of life mm -hmm. thank you um, any other question and what's so interesting about this book, it's cyclical too, because it opens on page one with an illustration of the egg, but then it ends on page 781 with an illustration of the ancestor. Uh, yes, uh, we had a question there. Let's get the microphone there if we can. And then, yes. Hi, um, I'm going to ask both of you a question. I had a dream last night. And in the dream, there was a cat. But the cat was wearing lipstick and had a human face. <laughs> and um, I, the lipstick was what called my attention. So I said, hmm, who, you know, your cat. And I started talking, and the cat started talking to me like I'm talking to you. And I said, oh, you're not a cat. You're a person. She goes, yeah, I'm a person. So I was fascinated because there was nothing threatening about it, but it was that she was a cat with a human face. And I'm just wondering if you could give me any insight into that. It was very unusual. <laughs> It'll cost you. <laughs> as long as it wasn't a pig with lipstick. <laughs> well, that was, your, that was your cat familiar. That was your little cat soul in some way. And, you know, I'd look at it as that, um, you know, a dream is an altered state. Yeah. And what you can see and experience in a dream are just different from what you might uh, right here. Right. And so I'd look at it you know, as a sort of a bush soul kind of a thing, that it's an a or as a witch's animal familiar. That would be the mythology behind an image like that and see what it has to say. Well, it was just the shape-shifting that I was referring to. Like, in other words, it was both an, a cat and a person. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when it goes back and forth like that, yeah. that it's part of what's being revealed, so to speak, in the dream is that impermanence okay. of life or of everything. Right. And, and the inter is there's something um, that's being shaken up and it's got to do with your cat soul. And that's all I can say in less than Thank 50 you. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to say that's all we have time for today? Um, we have a question here. Yeah? Rachel, yeah. 
Well, my question is really to, to almost anyone who would want to take it, um, because you, when you have the symbols, you know, in a sense in the book, they're, they're concrete in a particular way. And yet, there's something about ritual that means that they're going through time, and so they're made dynamic. Um, and certainly, as someone who comes from performance, I see that, but in, but in everything everyone's talked about, and it's not, you know, it's that place in between whether it's shape shifting or transformation, but it's dynamic and, and it moves. And I just would love to get your kind of reflections on that, that place where it goes from something that, that is an image on a page that becomes dynamic and, and moves through time. But I just say one really quick thing as you look through the book, you'll get that feeling also because one image starts to go on another, just the way we saw that little, you know, the guy who, would, the, who had the eye thing that was a mental patient, all right, who was going through like a werewolf shape shift, in, you know, in the state of the mental illness. The book has that feeling, not that it's a, an insane piece of writing, <laughs> but that you get the feeling of it moving, the, the image is moving through time as you go through the book. So it has a ritual space, kind of like what Leslie was was evoking yeah. at the beginning here. And Leslie has something to say about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the book and archetypal symbols in general are really not these precise imprints of immutable symbolization with stars and twinkles like a Christmas tree on them. I actually think the book is more like a song. The book is like a song and the images have that melodic concentric circles. So the book and the images, it all weaves together like a big melody. I mean, do you want to address anything? I think really a ritual is uh, acting out a symbol. It, it's just the movement of the symbol. We've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, yes, if you've got a question, sure. Mine is a simple question. Oh, good. From all the symbols that you have in the book that I haven't purchased or read yet, why would you choose that open hand for the cover? Hmm. <laughs> 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 Because the hand is what makes us human. Um, the hand uh, is making us, we can make things. And the hand made us conscious. But the hand is also the hand of God. It's the hand of spirit. So it's in the hand gestures and it says so many things. It says stop. It says, oh, I give a gift. Or don't fear. Or you can continue. Or I'm going to punch your lights out. <laughs> <sighs> we have a question right in the back. Keep your hand up. Um, and of course, the, the, the hand in, in, in the Tanka paintings upstairs and the mudras um, are, are very, very important in terms of um, our particular iconography. Yes. Uh, my name is Heather. I want to thank Ami and everyone that was involved in um, producing this book. I was in the gift shop just now and encountered it physically for the first time and just um, opened the page to see what would spring out. And I actually saw the image of the pomegranate. And it's the pomegranate time, obviously, and I happen to currently be serendipitously in, um, exploring the deeper mysteries of Persephone. But what came out of the page for me was the quote, there was a quote there, or not a quote, but um, something was contributed by a male artist or something, and it said something to, along the lines of the supremacy of the phallic symbol, the phallus, on the page. And I thought that was really jarring and it kind of made me cranky. And um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask how those, how some of the choices were made to put things together that would really jar some of that, um, some of those, some of those thoughts. I don't remember that exact, <laughs> <laughs> but we did, we did juxtapose many things: uh, facts, science, poetry, uh, the images, uh, and sometimes they surprised the connection and combinations. Uh, 
Um, we've got a hand up right at the back, and then we'll come to um, whoever had a hand up. Yes, here. Okay. So, Paul, you get that one. And Jennifer, we can get the microphone to this lady. Yeah. Uh, lady at the back first. It's not so much a question, but recently a friend told me about a film, a documentary that was made, and they took all these children, five, six, seven-year-olds, and they showed them hundreds of corporate uh, logos, and they could identify 300 corporate logos, but not 10 flowers. It's chilling, isn't it? And I just uh, now realize, you know, your book coming out at this time perhaps uh, will nourish some of that desire for um, taking in more symbols of depth and um, sacredness rather than just the corporate. So thank you. Yes. Um, thanks. Uh, my name is Carol, and uh, thank you so much for this wonderful um, conversation this evening. I've been thinking, uh, you know, when they talked about the images becoming dynamic, um, and also what the lady was saying about there about what children recognize, and the whole thing of um, um, Spider-Man on Broadway, and the image, you know, of of Spider, the great Spider Mother, and <laughs> some of the problems that are occurring with the production of that particular thing may have to do with when you tap into the great spider mother, you're going to have some of those problems. And <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's a, a, a wonderful thing, and the children, I know my, my grandchildren want to see it, but I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant, so I don't know what that said. <laughs> Spider-Man's a shapeshifter, right? It's another... Right. Does anybody want to spin a web out of that particular remark? <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's get the microphone. To the, yes, yeah, the back, thanks. I just had a comment uh, referring back to the pomegranate image, which uh, I did not write the text, but... I think the phallus coming up uh, in regard to, in relation to the Persephone myth, the way it pops up, jars, tears one out of one's world underground is, while it might seem out of place, also strangely appropriate. And that is sort of what images do. They surprise us, they take us out of our daily life, and we don't know where we'll end up. So. Well, I think at this point, we'd like to surprise um, two people here. Um, with a gift of um, this book. Melinda Haas. Um, Melinda would like to present uh, the Book of Symbols to uh, two people who not only created this whole world you are now in, but also um, are uh, really the benefactors of the reception you're just about to join, um, Shelley and Donald Rubin. Paul, Paul, can we have the microphone? We were talking before. Melinda, microphone's coming to, to you right now. We were talking before about how natural the conjunction is between this place and Aris, but natural though it is not to be taken for granted. We thank you so much for allowing us to uh, give birth to this, uh, this uh, entity here in just exactly the right place. And I also want to thank Beverly Zabriskie for making it all possible. Well, yes, you, you made the connection possible. Thank you very much. I always live with symbols. I have a few different interpretations because I had no training, but the first discussion I heard on, on symbols was on Ask the Place uh, uh, over 50 years ago with Joseph Campbell. Mm. And he was the one that introduced me. And uh, I think we need to, to praise him and give him tribute.
because he brought symbols, I think, to many of us. Thank you. Oh, yes, Melinda, sure. Last but not least is Tim McHenry. Oh, oh hardly. Um, <laughs> I don't really have to say any more. All right. Oh, my goodness, I get a book. Thank you. That's very good yeah. kind of you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I don't know uh, quite how to end this because... Um, there are a lot of lot of symbols in this rather substantial book, but I do urge you to acquire one because, um, as Leslie says, it fits very neatly in the lap when curled up on a sofa, uh, or indeed in any position, as we've seen on stage. And um, but I will um, le let me let us give you something. Um, we'd like to give uh, because the subject has been of dreaming has come up quite a lot in this discussion about symbols. And we're premiering a film um, in February called The Edge of Dreaming. It's about a woman who has a dream that a horse is to die. And the next morning she discovers him dead in the paddock. Then her next dream is that she's going to die in her 48th year. And that comes to pass as well, or it seems to. And it's a fascinating exploration of the significance and the power of dreaming in our lives. And we're premiering it on the 16th of February as part of Brainwave. And we're going to give away two tickets to the premiere. If you want to fill out your visit information cards that you're probably warming on your seats right now, um, please do so. And the um, uh, the, uh, the little container for visit information cards will be on the book signing table. So you can do both at the same time. You can buy a book, get it signed by some of the contributors, and uh, pop your card in the box, and then we'll notify you by email um, who's, who's won the drawing. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank our wonderful guests who have explored and been adventuresome in exploring these symbols um, with us uh, this evening. Uh, Pat Steer, Dan Herlin, and Leslie Dill. Please give them a hand. <laughs> and, and the many, many contributors to this book. Um, it's a really profound book, and we've only heard from um, three of the contributors, um, Ami Romberg and Priscilla Rogers and Sherry Salmon, uh, but there are many more, and I think there are quite a few in the audience um, tonight. So identify yourselves at the reception upstairs, because I'm sure people will want to, um, yes, possibly even take issue with um, some of the entries that you've made, but isn't that a healthy thing? Because we've all want to interpret these things in our own personal way. And uh, that's what makes this book also very personal. Ami, do you want to have the last word? contributor from Ruger Museum, Martin Brown wrote our mandala, beautiful mandala, please. Martin Brown, our chief curator. In his customary modesty, he didn't let me know that. But, um, oh, I didn't get to the mandala section in time before this evening. But, um, well, Join us upstairs, courtesy of the Rubens, we have got a reception, wine will flow, beer will flow, and there's, um, and books will flow as well, um, as flow as beautifully as Pat Steer's paintings. Please join us upstairs. Thank you so much for coming out.